Hey guys, Kate Paul here. I'm going to be walking you through how to design levels in the indie game Rain World. We've got a pretty strong Discord community, so if you want information or if you have any questions, just go ahead and check it out. Uh, if you want to tag me at K A E P O R O, we'll get you uh, the right person. There is also a modding wiki for the game before you begin, and a lot of important shortcuts are found in here. It's important before you begin developing a new region that you do a little bit of planning in advance. I recommend at a minimum just drawing it out, but you definitely want to have a roadmap in place before you get started because this can take a long amount of time and you don't want to find yourself kind of aimlessly making levels. They should flow kind of seamlessly just like they do in the main game. Before you begin, you're going to need to go to raindb.net, which you can find pretty easily through Google. There's a ton of mods uploaded here. We're primarily concerned with these region mods. So we've got the root and side house, and that's pretty much it. There's a couple of other mods that add levels and make some tweaks, but that's that's basically it. So in order to get started, you're going to go to tools, and then you've got the official level he editor here, and then extended dev tools and dev tools. So you need one version of the dev tools, and this is going to let you change the colors in the game and also apply things like effects. I won't be going into that in this video. The official level editor is what we're primarily concerned with. So once you download it, it'll just uh, you'll just have to unzip it somewhere on your computer and then you can run it. So I've already got it right here. So one thing you need to keep in mind is that when you're finally done with your level or your region or whatever it is you're trying to do, you need to put it in a a kind of format where other people can easily install it. So I've been periodically going in and adding my levels to a folder, which basically people can just copy and paste into their Rain World um, file location, and they'll be able to play the game uh, and also play through that content. So if you look here, you've got the levels itself and the level editor. Um, there's a couple of different folders here. The only one you're really concerned with is the level editor, level editor projects, and levels. So the projects are going to have the actual files for your maps. This is how you're going to actually tweak them in the level editor. So if you lose these, you can't make any edits to your levels. And then levels is going to produce the files that are actually used by Rain World. So you're going to have a text document and an image. This text document tells the game basically how the character interacts with the area and sets a couple other basic parameters. And then the actual image is what you see while you're playing the game. In order to produce those, you're going to need to open up the level editor. Now, as a forewarning, you want to kind of play around this cautiously because it is prone to crashing like see if I hit escape here it's just going to explode so you should make backups and you should also save periodically so we're just going to start off by going down here um, you navigate this with the arrow keys uh, the, so I'm going to go to world um, if you want to create a new one you can just press N and that will create kind of like a new folder then you got here, um, this is my specific region, but you can check out all the regions of the base game if you're looking for inspiration or you want to know how something was done in a certain room. So in here you've got the levels that I've made. So I've got kind of like a blank template here. It just has the right dimension so I can easily kind of just get going on that. So I've already done that. And let's see going back to my little map here i've got d15 which i'm going to have connect to d02 and d14 and also it will connect to d17 so it's going to have three entrances so once you get into this screen you want to update the preview and you're going to see that it's completely blank so we're going to start adding some stuff to it now the order i recommend you do this is first save your map go in here check level size then set cameras then 
update your geometry, set tiles, set effects, set props, and set light. If you're going to have water in your level, you'll go up and you'll adjust that in the environment section. Prioritizing the camera is going to let you render one part of your map before the rest. That way, if you make kind of like a tweak because maybe something didn't look quite right, you'll be able to just see what that looks like if you didn't make any changes to the rest of your level. So the way Rainworld works is each room has multiple different screens. And as you move from one screen to the next, it will automatically um, draw the screen that you entered. Um, so if you go to cameras here, well, actually, before we do that, levels, this is where you have the actual dimensions for your room. So the width for every single room is going to be 72 by 43. If you're going to have a room that has um, a different height or width, then you'll need to change that. So ultimately, the dimensions of your room don't really matter. What matters is the screens in the room. Anything you want the character to actually see needs to be contained within those screens. So for the width, it's going to be 72. If you have multiple screens, you're going to add, I think, 52 for each one of those screens. So just take 72 plus 52. That would be your, your, uh, your new width. For height, it's always just multiples of 43, so 43, 86, and so on and so forth. Then you hit A to confirm that. Once you've set your levels, you'll go into cameras. So you're going to have a single camera in here by default. So if you're just making a single screen, it's not a big deal. Um, you can pick up this camera with E, move it around, drop it with P. If you want to create a new camera, because it's going to be a room with multiple screens, hit in, and then press P. Typically when you're doing that though, you're going to want to have these red borders kind of like lined up. So the purple border is going to be the boundaries of your room. If you go outside of those, it's like going out of bounds. And if you go out of bounds on the, on the lower part, then it counts as a pitfall and will kill your character. Um, so yeah, definitely you want to try and keep these cameras centered on what you want the player to see. If you want to delete a camera, press D, but you always got to have at least one camera. So I'm going to go back up here, or sorry, load. So we're back to our room. The camera is fine. Next thing you've got whether or not you have pitfalls. So if you do, then if someone falls out of the boundaries, then they'll basically die and have to start over. Um, so this room isn't going to have pitfalls. Basically, there's no way for you to fall and die. Sunlight, you should pretty much always keep on. If you want to tweak it, do so in the light editor. So you get the geometry editor here. And this is where you're actually going to see the playable area and some of the really crude graphics for the level. So, um, there's a bunch of different tools in here, but since this is an interior level, I'm just going to go ahead and hit layer one with just a, a solid block of cave or material. So, for these tools, inverse lets you toggle between the two states. You don't really need it. Paint walls lets you paint individual walls, like boom. Paint air does the opposite. Um, slopes, it's going to let you create little slopes that you can just walk up. Floors, uh, like most platformers, if you stand on top of these and hold down, you'll pass right through them. Rectangle walls will let you select an area. This is the tool you're going to be using the most, uh, rectangle wall and rectangle air. Move the level. If you move outside of the playable area, you'll see this kind of stops. And then you can use the arrow keys to move the bounding border of your map. Placing a rock, basically 90% chance that a rock will spawn in that location in the base game. These right here, you've got cracked terrain. Basically, Slugcat can crawl through these little holes in the ground. It's not used super often, but you might be able to do something cool with it. Horizontal beams, set beams that you can crawl on. Vertical beams, same thing. 
you want to get rid of them, just go back over them with the same tool. Glass wall makes windows, they're invisible walls, so if you want to use them like windows, make sure to put something there that the player can recognize. Copy backwards. This is if you want to copy things between layers. So it's important to note that Rain World is built between three different layers, with layer one being the foreground that you interact with, and layer two being the immediate background, which would be like the opposite wall of a room, and layer three is going to be open sky or distant objects. Now, as far as Rain World's de design philosophy is concerned, interior rooms typically only have two layers, and they they're usually simpler than exterior rooms. Exterior rooms tend to have a lot going on, and you can see things going off in the distance. So in order to toggle between those layers, you go to this layer tool down at the bottom left, and if you click between them, you're going to go between layer one, two, and three. So this tool right here, which lets you copy things backwards, if I just highlight something on layer one, it's going to push it to layer two, and from two to three, and then that's where it stops. You can't go back to layer one. So again, layer two objects can't be interacted with. So if I want to do like a pipe going across the room, this will appear in the background, but you can't actually step on it. Uh, so each of the layers have different colors. Layer one is black. Layer two is green. And layer three is kind of like this red color. And you can see objects in the background based off of what is um, basically the combination of these. Okay, there's this clear all tool, which is gonna get rid of everything on all layers. Really good if you wanna just start over on a section, because I could just wipe out everything I've done. So if I really don't want something on layer three, it's gone. All right, so shortcuts are kind of a big thing in rain world. So like, let's say I want uh, someone to be able to get on top of this block from the side. You have to go in one block, just like that, and then create this little dot here. And then I can basically just go through the wall. If, um, and then on the opposite end, I just do the same thing. You always have to have this lip here. And now I've got a shortcut. There's other types of shortcuts out here. So like, let's say I want to have one that um, spawns a creature. There you go. Now creatures can spawn in that if you set it through the world file. If you want to have one which spawns, uh, which the player can use to hop between rooms, then you'll just go in here and hit entrance. There's also one for scavenger holes, uh, for whack-a-mole holes, which basically a creature could use to go from the bottom of this room up to the top. They can kind of just warp between them. You got a couple here which deal with uh, flies in the game. So if you don't want them hanging on stuff, then you can put that there. If you uh, want them to kind of congregate in certain areas, then you can put this hive down. Just note that if you don't set something as a swarm room in the world file, they won't appear. Waterfalls. So this basically just makes a stream of water coming down from the W. It goes in a straight line, so it doesn't really matter what's above it to the sides. And then worm grass, uh, the height of the worm grass and kind of how lethal it is depends on how many of these things you got. So we'll just wipe all this out, start over. So you typically want to leave a little bit of room on the sides. So, because otherwise it feels a little janky if people are just like instantly warping between rooms. So we'll just set an entrance to the area. I'm not actually going to use this room in the game, just kind of like to demo it show you what it looks like. So the player is going to enter from the left and uh, maybe they want to get out of the room through the top right. So we'll put like a wall here and then we'll have a room of some sort. You kind of want to make the world believable just like the base game. So if uh, yeah, just try and keep similar visual elements going throughout the room. And then right here, we're going to have to exit out of it. So like you see there, you can also use the shortcuts 
just to try and uh, create rectangles of error. So this right here is really all you need to create a level in Rain World. I mean, I could take this right now and I could export it and you could play it just right off the bat. So I've got some pipes here, some pipes or some poles, I mean, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I could create some, you know, some visual flare, add a pipe here, maybe a two by two pipe. I could create like, uh, let's see. Well, we'll want a creature to spawn in this room. So we'll, uh, we'll put him there and then creature spawns or shortcuts on the, on the floor. They tend to have a, an actual floor above them. So you're not falling in them. So you got a dragon den and yeah, this, this is pretty much a, a rain world level. So we got the geometry set up. If I want to have a little bit more depth, then I can go in here and just copy the, uh, the foreground into the background. And then to set a far or a distant background, I'll just go to layer three and again, I'll just highlight all this stuff. And then to make layer two stand out, I'm going to add, you know, another pipe. Then maybe right here, I'll add something hanging in the middle. And this will just be kind of suspended from the ceiling. So now you got to actually draw the graphics for the room. So I start by going to layer one, because that's what players are going to see um, kind of in the foreground. So it's the most important thing to get right. You've got materials, and then you got a bunch of different objects that you can place. So for materials, you'll want to go find your material of preference. So let's say I want this room to be mostly made of concrete. I'll just go hover over it and select E. You navigate this with WASD. Um, so actually, we'll just say it's made of bricks. Why not? If you want uh, to flood an area with that material, just hit F or V, and then you can like paint a whole area at once. You can't get rid of everything at once with the, the right mouse button. So if you have a lot of stuff you want to get rid of, just go over to special and hit rectangle clear. So what I tend to do is I start with kind of like the must fills. So pipes or something that are pretty obvious. So I'm just going to go over here and I'm going to add some pipes. Then some connecting sections. Get those turns in there. Cool. So it looks like the pipes are done on layer one. We'll go to layer two. And it looks like our pipes actually fell into the background when we copied things over. So if you don't want them to have that much depth, then go back up to layer two. Find the pipe sections that you don't like. Go ahead and erase them. Okay, we'll go back to the towel editor. And now you see I can't put anything on them. So we'll get this pipe section here. Now if you see something that appears like it's um, kind of covered in shadow, that just means that there's something on the layer above it which is keeping you from seeing it. So like I just showed, these are kind of hidden in shadow. It doesn't matter if they're there or not. You can, if you're putting a lot of stuff like up here, like no one's going to see that, so don't waste your time. Another thing that's kind of like a must fill is crawl holes. If you have something like this, uh, dollars or donuts, your best bet is just to put a hatch cover over it. That's what they do in the base game, and you see it constantly. Down here, we've got kind of like a long tubular section, and then you've got a small crawl hole here. So if you want, you could use crawl holes to flood the foreground with something to make it a little interesting, or you can go over to the special pipe section and add some kind of foreground pipes. You don't want things to look too samey, so just kind of break it up a little bit. Rain World's falling apart, so you should do your best to ensure it is completely destroyed looking. Add some wall wires. 
And then uh, let's see, we've got this pipe section here. So you could use Pipeish to kind of create a pipe section yourself. But in this case, I'm just going to go down to big inside pipes and I'm going to fill this area myself. I think that'll work. Now we're on layer two, so remember a lot of the stuff you're probably not going to see. Let me just move these up to the foreground real quick. Cool. All right, so those are on the foreground. Now, uh, let's see. We're going to put a floor there. That way people don't just fall into it, right? You don't really need that. In fact, we could actually fill that in if you want to. So you can navigate through these at any time by pressing the, uh, the top num row. So if you want to go to like the geometry editor, then you hit two. If you want to go back to the main page, one, three is going to take you to the, the uh, tile editor. So we're going to fill this in on layer two because we don't really need to have that depth here. And we can do it here as well. Don't really need the depth. But this larger area, we can keep it a bit open. Cool. All right, so this is just some hanging machine of some sort. So we'll go over to the machine section and uh, it'll be a, a machine box. It'll be just there doing its thing. So pipes, uh, you typically if you're gonna have a pipe somewhere, it needs to have a purpose. So pipe isn't just gonna be going into the wall, bring it into a tank holder. For these larger ones, you could kind of have it fade into some machinery. So we'll put, uh, We'll put a hub machine here with a feather box next to it. And then on this side, we'll use some machine boxes. And then we'll flood them with some random machines to keep it from looking a, a, bit, too, uh, a bit too clean. Around the X, kind of like the, these, uh, outer paths, taking you out of the level, those shortcuts, we're going to put some big metal. And then because bricks are our main material, we're just going to fill some bricks along the outside here. Now if this is blank, that's fine. It's going to fill it in either way. I just want to kind of create a, a visual reminder to myself because I'm going to be using large trash as the outer border for my room and I don't want it jumping into the foreground. So let's say we'll put some dirt here. And then we will create some pipes that are kind of leaking out to the foreground. So small pipes, they're gonna break out right here. And then, let me just fix this real quick. Okay, then we're gonna go back over here and we'll create some uh, cross box hatches. And as just that final touch, we'll go and we will create some large trash going around the outside. You don't want it to be right up next to it because Unless you're trying for a really dirty looking room, uh, it's not needed. And most of this is going to blend in the background once you start adding effects. Cool, and that's your foreground. For this layer, I want to see what exactly the player can possibly see. So go in here and just fill it with some kind of background effect. So let's go with random machines. So you can see only in this section on the right here is, are you actually going to be able to to view that. And then the final background, we're just going to use, we'll create, create kind of like a more of a, a north ornate pattern. We're going to have some machinery. So it doesn't need to be super neat looking the way the editor is set up. 
basically anything you do is going to come out looking awesome. So we'll have two of these. And then maybe we'll borrow some visual elements from a different level. And we'll have some, um, some dirt in the background. Go ahead and flood the whole area with that. Now, you still probably want to have some something in layer 3, even if you had elements in layer 1 and layer 2, because some of them, like small pipes or dense pipes, for example, they don't fill it completely, so you can still see things behind them. If you don't want that to be open air, then just go ahead and put something behind it, like dirt. Then we'll uh, have some big metal. There'll be some columns. Just like that. And then maybe we'll have some horizontal beams going between those. Like that. Sure. And that's really all you need to do. So we've got a level right now and we could import that into the game and it would look okay. But if you want to make it look good, go into the effects section. Now every room in Rain World has black goo and slime. So go ahead and navigate this using WAST. And when you find something you like, hit the space bar over it and it will add it to that bottom section. So we're gonna start by painting this area with slime. Just gonna make it look a little bit messier. So uh, W or sorry R and F are gonna let you increase the size of the tool. So and again, there's a ton of different hotkeys for all this stuff. So check out the modding wiki uh, if you have any questions on what exactly needs to go where. So I'm just gonna make it look kind of slimy. That looks fine. We're also gonna add some uh, some rust. We got some machines up here. Maybe this one's a little rusty. Uh, barnacles, uh, maybe we'll have some barnacles over the top part of it. Rubble, this is basically going to be like some trash or something that's kind of just piled up over time. And if you really want to make an area look kind of dirty, then you can go back into the geometry editor, put yourself on layer one or two, and then go back into the tile editor go over to materials then add some trash so it looks like some trash is just collected on the ground okay back into the effects editor we're gonna add some wires along the top so wires will basically just procedurally generate in those areas and we'll add some plants so there's a bunch of different options here so let's say I want to add just a single fern somewhere. If I hit space and add it to my library down at the bottom, it's going to let me add just one of these. So using WAST again, once I'm in this, this little menu, I can go over here and I can select which layer it's on. So maybe we want it to appear in layer two. And we want it to be dead, so this planet's long gone. If I want to go back and adjust one of the effects I've added, just hit E, find it hit space and you'll be able to go in here and maybe add some rubble back in this section. Cool, and then for the final touch we're going to add black goo and this is going to let stuff fade in the background. So if you're working on an outside map you'll want it to be, you want black goo on basically anything that the slug cat couldn't see. So an example of an exterior map is going to look something like this. Right, because he might be able to actually see that stuff. Now for an interior map, especially if it's like a pipe section, it's going to be a lot more constrained. So you're not going to be able to see much outside of just the actual playable area. So an interior section might look like this. So this is an interior section, so I'll keep it looking like that. Now we've got the prop editor and the light editor. So the prop editor is going to let you add things like, let's say, tubes or wires. 
Um, it'll let you add different uh, tiles, but you can actually go in and tweak them. So this is the most complicated as far as heart, hot keys are concerned, which is why they're down at the bottom. So you can use Q and E to spin them around. If you hold space, it'll speed that process up. WASD is going to let you go in and uh, choose the actual objects from their library. If you want to skew something so it looks like it's moving between layers, you're going to go over to J, U, what, U, I, O, and P. So U, I, O, and P are going to let you skew it around. It's kind of hard to see and you don't need to mess with it for the most part. Um, if you want to remove your skew, hit K. If you've stretched something out, hit T and that will reset it. So to spin something, remember Q, E to adjust the perspective on it, U, I, O, P, K to reset, to move the dimensions. You're going to use G, H, Y, and J, and then to get rid of that, T. If you want to move something between layers, so like let's say you want to have a circular sign, you'll see the prop depth on there. Now I can move this with L between the different layers. But if I want to have something hidden beside something else on the same layer, you'll do that with the right mouse button. So if I want to have a circular sign on layer one, but behind that I want to have some graffiti, then I just hit the right mouse button and now that will appear behind it like that. If you want to get rid of something, hold V, click it. If you want to sample something, hold V and click it and it will just add it to your current uh, selected object. If you're trying to add some tubes, for example, or some wires, just make sure set up like that. Now, wires don't really just exist all over the place. They're typically going between machines. So try and keep that in mind. You want your levels to kind of make sense, but you can get away with some stuff. If uh, you want to change how large or how uh, tight it is, you'll do that the same way you would stretch any other object out. So if I want it to be like really loose, I could hold Y. If I want to make it really tight, I could go down here. You're basically just adjusting the number of nodes on it. So we'll just add some tubes here. And then you've got the light editor. The light editor is what's going to create some depth in your room. And it's also going to allow you to create shadows. So use J and L to change the depth of your light and then K to bring it out. If you want to bring it back in, hit I. If you want to adjust the size, the dimensions of your box or your shadows, or your light, just go ahead and use WASD. So if it's an exterior room, you want it to be light and then you're going to paint in shadows. If it's an interior room, you're going to just flood the area with shadow. Like so. And then you're going to paint it with light. So if let's say we want to have some beams of light coming in here. We'll just make it a little bit smaller. Use Q and E to spin it if you want to bring it back to normal, right click. And then to change the light pattern, you use R and F, which will let you see different patterns you could flood it with. To paint light instead of shadow, hit Z. So we're gonna have some light coming into this room. And it'll just look like that. And if you wanna add a little bit more depth to it, then maybe you could go in, I don't know, find something like this. Cool. Now you get some light bleeding into the room. And if let's say you want to simulate some like cross beams or something or some pipes in the foreground that the player can't see, then just go ahead. You can simulate that here. So we get some beams 
or some pipes or something that are just kind of going across it. Now the light editor tweaks out whenever you exit it, so just hit um, one and then two or any other combination. Let's say we want some water in this room, go to environment. Now in this section, it's pretty simple. You want water in the room, hit W. You want it removed, W again. If you want to adjust the level, hold L, move up and down with the mouse. If you want to push that into the background, hit F. So let's say we want this little thing down here, this little pipe section to be full of water. Boom, now it's flooded. And that is literally all you need to do in order to create a level in the world. So if we hit render level, this takes a little while, but it's going to start drawing the level for us. It's going to start by creating the visual elements, and then it's going to actually draw up the graphics. So this is what it looks like just from the base. You can see some of the foreground elements like these pipes. If you don't like something, then you can hit tab to exit out while it's still rendering. So if like we really don't like these bricks, maybe they don't look that good, then you can go ahead and change those with, by changing the default material. But generally speaking, regardless of what you do, it's kind of hard to make a map that just looks really bad. So to pick up where we left off, we just got done creating a level. We can check it out here, it's ARD15. So it looks pretty good, but you'd really want to check it out, see what it looks like in game. So just go ahead and copy both it and its associated file. Then go into the game's install folder, find the location where you want to paste it. I'm going to go ahead and move it over there. You got ARD15. And again, we're just going to connect it somehow. So we'll go ARD15. And it's going to connect to AR, let's see. This one will connect to AR DO5. Then we're going to take AR DO5 and we're going to change that. So now we're actually going to go ahead and boot the game up. Now, typically, once you get done adding a level to it, uh, the game is going to freak out and say that things have been changed. So go into the options, change your save slot, and then return to that save slot, and you can load right in. There is a checksum fix on RayDB, which gets rid of this if you want to save a little bit of time. So once you load in, by default, after you've installed the dev tools, and you can find out how to do that through RayDB itself, um, once you're in the actual game, hit O, and that will allow you to turn it off and on. If you want to fill up your food pips, hit Q. If you want to kind of teleport around towards the cursor, hold B, and then you can just move it. If you want to check some of the diagnostic information on the room, you want to hit M, and it will show you which creatures are where, as well as what the different entrances are labeled as. So when you're in the world file, the actual order is going to be based off what you see in DevTools. So this is listed as zero, so if there's three entrances in the room, this is going to be the one that's going to be in the furthest left part of that world file for this room. All right. So go ahead and teleport up to the top here. Now, if you want to see if a creature can reach a certain part of your room, then you'll just go ahead and hit P. So let's say, like, can a green lizard reach this tile? So just hover over it by using the arrow keys. Then select green lizard, click in that location, and this is what a green lizard can reach in this particular room. Can he get up here? If he's up top, he can fall down, but he can't get back up from the bottom. If you really wanted him to get up from the bottom, you would need to put a whack-a-mole hole up here. What about like a white lizard because they can crawl in the background? Well, it looks like they can go pretty much everywhere in this room. Uh, vultures? Can vultures get in here? Well, not really because they can't enter from the sky. So that's how that particular tool works. just helps you set the creature's pathing. The other major tool you're going to want to use is by hitting H. Now this has a ton of different information, so it's the most important one to get right. 
you've got room settings, objects, sounds, and maps. So maps, when you click that, is going to show you all the different maps in the area. So we're on ARB14 right now. So you've got two different views. You've got the dev view and then the canyon view. Now mine's a little messed up right now, so I can't actually adjust these. But the canyon view is what you see in-game, and the dev view is there to help you do things like set up room attractiveness. So different creatures, uh, you're going to want to keep them in certain rooms, like let's say spiders for example, they want to be in dark areas, so if you don't want them running around outside, then you could just go find a room um, and tag it as being something that spiders like hate visiting, or maybe they love a particular room sound so you can see that this room is just absolutely saturated i mean it's totally flooded with all kinds of stuff so it's kind of a bad one for us to show off so we're going to go all the way down here because i'm just dragging it and we're going to find our room now if i remember correctly it was connected to d05 so DO5, let me just play through this area. So DO5 is over here. So this is another room I've already built. And this should be our room. So you can tell it doesn't really look all that good. We're going to make some changes here. So we'll start with sounds because it's really simple. You've got omnidirectional sounds which will play regardless of where you're at in the room and you've got spot sounds. Spot sounds will get louder as you approach them. Directional sounds act like omnidirectional sounds, but they're only going to play in one of your headsets. So let's set a, a spot sound here for some machinery. So we'll use utility one. You can tell as you get closer to it, it gets louder. So the pitch can be adjusted. This bottom option here is going to set the fade range of it. So if, let's say we just pretend that this little thing that we have in the background is a machine. As you get closer to it, it'll get louder and louder. Once you enter the inner circle, it will play at the maximum volume that you have set it. Um, so that should be good. Once you make a change, just hit save. And it will keep that. So now if we walk around and approach it, see how that works. Now, objects are things like light sources, like if you want to make a particular room a bit brighter or some, if you want a machine giving off some light, you can go ahead and do that. You can change which effect colors you've got. If you want to get rid of one of these objects, just drag it to the bottom left and hit, uh, send it to the trash bin. A lot of these won't appear until you restart the area, so either hit R, which will send you back to your save room, die, restart the game, something like that. So a bunch of different objects here, like if you want to add a spear or if you want to make, um, add some jellyfish in the water, you can just put them there. So now a jellyfish will appear and after you get rid of it, it'll respawn 2 to 11 cycles. If you want to add a, uh, I don't know, you want to add a custom decal, you can go ahead and do that as well. So like, let's say we want our machine to have a little bit of visual flare. We can just go ahead and drape a custom decal over it. So we'll set something like, um, I don't know, birdie maybe. So we'll increase the alpha on it. Maybe make it look a little bit eroded. And then we can make it appear in some parts of it, like it'll appear behind this pipe, right? So it wouldn't make sense for that decal to also be on this kind of hanging tube. So now it just appears back there. Pallets are another thing that you want to hit up right when you enter a new room. So these pallets are going to change the colors for your room. So just set it to whatever you want, whatever looks good, whatever matches the visual theme of your 
region. So if we'll just call this as like a real like a muddy kind of region, and we'll use palette 19. If you want to add a secondary palette, you can do that as well. So there's lots of ways that you can kind of use these to take advantage of um, just your own innovation. If you want to make it seem like you're going from a really dark cave to like a bright outside area, for example, you could have multiple screens set up. And as you go from one to the next, you'll uh, the screen value will adjust. Because if you have multiple screens, then it will show as screen zero, screen one, two, three, four, etc. So you could have like screen or, uh, palette 10, which is super dark, right? And it could get gradually brighter. So we got our real muddy looking level here. Yeah, we got our real muddy looking level here. Uh, grime is if you look in the back, you've got this oil slick looking stuff. If you don't want it, you can bring it all to the side. If you do, then you can uh, bring it up a little bit more. Uh, if you want to, to adjust the kind of like the density of items appearing, you can do that. So if you put 100% here, there's going to be items all over the place. The sphere percent is based off of your item density. So by default, if you've got 100% um, item density but 0% spheres, that means that 0% of the items which spawn are going to be spheres. If you put spear percent at 100%, that means 100% spears and no random items. Water light is going to adjust this little flickering stuff that you see on the screen. Like if you look right here, you can set that to whatever. Clouds are going to adjust the, uh, the clouds that you created. Now, do pay note that I've reduced the rain intensity and rumble intensity to 0% because otherwise, seeing as how we're at the end of a cycle, um, it would just kill me. So you can't really see what the cloud setting looks like uh, because it's just going to adjust the cloud coverage. Right now, because it is raining, all you can do is turn it off and on. So you can still kind of see what it looks like, and some palettes show that more than others. So that's what our, our light looks like, and that's what it looks like off. Uh, there's other objects that you can set in here, like in the room settings tab, you can go in and add things like fog. So now you can see there's fog all around the screen. Uh, there's a lot of other ones that you can add, like you could add sky dandelions if it was like a, uh, I don't know, you're building some sky islands type rooms. Um, a lot of these are going to require you to re-enter the area with R or by restarting, but not all of them. If you want to get rid of something, just go back, find it, and reselect it, and it will remove it. There's also a ton of settings here that have to do with uh, water, so just tweak them until you get something you like. Like if you're in an ocean, you want to have really uh, large waves, so set the amplitude high. If you want to get funky with it, you can make the wavelength really short, and there's just a lot of things that you could do. Set the speed, you could change the direction if it's flowing to the right or the left, lots of different things. The last thing is triggers, and this isn't explored in the modding wiki all that much. The most common one you're going to use are music triggers. Now this does require you to restart, but it's pretty easy to set up. Some of the other ones, I don't know exactly how they work, so I'm, I'm still figuring that out. So again, the most common one is setting up music. So you could change some settings here, like um, whether it can fire once or multiple times, or if there's a specific entrance that you have to come in from, for it to fire, which type of slug cat it applies to. And then you hit add event, and it will let you show whether you show, um, so music event, will play music. Stop music event will stop music. Pole mimic reveal. Basically, um, just like how the, the pole mimics will kind of do that little fluttery thing they do, when you enter that circle, it will automatically do that. That way people aren't just getting kind of like blindsided. It'll seem like kind of like a cheap death. You can kind of hint towards them if they're paying attention. 
pick up object instructions. We'll, uh, if Iggy is in the room, he'll show up and show you something. Uh, show projected image event. This is something that requires a bit of programming, but it will basically force Iggy into the room, and then he will show you kind of like a little window of how something's done. Some of those are pre-made and built on the objects tab, like long jump and trading instructions, uh, so they're a lot easier to add. So if you want to add some music, just hit music events, choose the song, we'll use Stargazer. You can change the volume, the fade in, we'll fade in after four seconds, um, and then how many transitions. So maybe if, uh, if room transitions is set to zero, then as soon as you leave the room, the music will fade out. If you set it at 10 after leaving 10 rooms, it will continue. So just play with the settings a little bit. If you want to get rid of your triggers, just drag it to the trash bin. It's pretty much how everything works. And that's it. I mean, we just built a, a new level in Rain World, and I spent a lot of time explaining how to do different things. So once you get it down, it can go pretty quick. Just remember, the most important thing is focus on objects in the foreground and play test your levels to make sure that they look good, they make sense, they mesh with the rest of the levels you're creating in a region, and it's fun. Alright, that's all I got. Thanks.